going to be talking about aquatic e ecosystems. So these are water ecosystems. So there are certain abiotic, that means non-living factors that affect an ecosystem. And that is the depth of the water and how much sun penetrates through it and the salt level. And so those three things are used to classify water ecosystems. So the first kind that we're gonna talk about are freshwater ecosystems. So obviously they do not have that much salt in them. Uh, as you can see, our earth is really made up of mostly salt water, mostly salt water. Only two and a half percent of the world's water is actually fresh water. And of that, about 68, well, 69% are glaciers and about 30% is groundwater uh, with just a little tiny bit, not even 1% being lakes and rivers. So that's why it's important really not to waste the fresh water. Um, so as water gets collected from like, for instance, mountains, so if there's condensation here like rain or snow that comes down, it's slowly going to gather and trickle into a like river. And this is called he the headwater where it's all coming in. And in this area, the water usually moves very slowly. Um, because it's slowly just trickling in. And then as it gathers to a river, in the middle of the river, it can be very fast moving and it can carry a lot of sediment and rocks and really move very, very fast once it's collected from all these little spots. Um, there's not a whole lot of life in it, usually in this very turbulent area because there's not much soil and there's not m many places for the water to settle down. At the mouth of the river, um, it usually spreads out again, slows down and forms like a delta where it, it feeds into an estuary. So I wanted to talk about also in this picture is a lake, some lakes and ponds. So this would be like the middle of the river where it's fast moving, turbulent. It's just going over rocks. Um, not a lot of life in that. Okay. So in lakes though, you have something where these layers of different temperature water form both in the summer and in the winter. So in the summer, obviously because the sun is shining on it, you can see that the hottest water is towards the top and then the there's a layer of cooler water and a very cold layer at the begin at the bottom. This is actually called a thermocline. You would expect, I don't know, I would expect that all of these layers would just mix. Like you pour them in a glass and they all mix, but they actually don't. Because they have different densities, they actually stay separate. I do a lot of diving. I've done tons of diving in the ocean and I've even done a little bit in lakes. And you can literally feel each layer as you go through it. And it's called a thermocline. And it's so weird and crazy to go through these like layers of different temperature water. Um, you get the same thing in the winter, except the warmer water is towards the bottom actually because it's insulated by the top and the top gets really cold. Now in the spring and in the fall, the water really mixes a lot because it's kind of this time where the sunlight isn't making the water hot anymore and it's all becoming the same temperature. So that's called overturn. So that's when nutrients from the bottom get brought up to the top and oxygen from the top can go to the bottom. So the two really cycle through in the spring and the fall. Okay, so there's different parts of a pond. The part that you like to step on the most, I think, and squish between your feet is the littoral zone. The littoral zone has tons of life. So I actually try to be really careful of it now because there's a lot of babies, eggs, um, things that are really important and delicate growing there. Um, in fact, it's one of the most lively parts of a lake or pond. So I try not to mash it up anymore. Um, but I did a lot when I was younger. So no judgment there. But then you're going to have the limnetic zone. And in that area, it's more like the open water. It's very well lit. And down at the bottom, you're going to have the profundal zone. Okay, where there's just not as much oxygen, it's pretty cold, and yet some stuff still lives there. 
Okay, none of that is extremely important for tests, but just um, none of that on the lake is that important, but I just wanted to um, let you know those things to go over it. Uh, so the intertidal zone in oceans. Uh, this is really important because the intertidal zone is where humans tend to play and hang out. Maybe some of you guys did over the summer or do throughout the year, but it's where the ocean meets the land. And tons of creatures actually live here and they have to be well adapted to have some parts of the day with water and some parts of the day without water. Uh, and so they have to be very diverse. You can have, you know, like here, urchins, stars, you have different uh, mollusks, you have um, different uh, sea grass, lettuce, uh, limpets, uh, lots of barnacles in this picture, crabs. There's a lot of cool stuff in this picture. Okay, so we are going to move down. So this is called the intertidal zone, by the way, where the tide comes up and down. So in the ocean, open ocean ecosystems, the main area of the ocean, when you think of the big blue ocean, is the pelagic zone. And I think of pelagic as like animals that can just swim anywhere. There's also the abyssal zone, which gets no sunlight whatsoever. And the animals down there have to actually rely on, um, because they can't use photosynthesis, a lot of them are chemotrophs, meaning they use chemicals to make food, or they feed on dead and decaying things that have fallen down. The benthic zone is just the bottom sandy part of the ocean, and sometimes it can have light, and sometimes it does not have light. Um, in the photic zone, meaning the part that gets light, like right here, in the photic, photic zone, there are animals there that use light to make their own food, like phytoplankton, use light to make food. And a lot of animals like whale sharks will eat tons of phytoplankton every day. Um, here's some plankton. Some of them will make their own. These will look, all look like zooplankton, meaning animal plankton, but some will be um, phyto, meaning plant plankton. Um, so those are the different parts of the ocean. and. We are going to move down to coral reefs. I love coral reefs. I worked for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. I replanted coral reefs. I like to help preserve some of them. I'm just part of my heart. Part of my heart is in the coral reefs. But coral reefs are usually in the photic zone. See how you can see light down here, even though you can see way up to the top of the water. It's still light there, meaning it is still. Um, light is still getting there. So usually they're in the photic zone. And I want to show you here, these are gorgeous pictures of um, a wetland. Wetlands and estuaries are actually transitional areas. So a wetland is an area that the ocean comes up and leaves water there every day and interesting little animals can live there. It's like a lake made out of salt ocean water. Um, but this actually can get rid of, I believe, more pollutants than I think anywhere on the earth. I, they're, they're amazing. Wetlands are huge to our ecosystem for getting rid of pollutants. And um, we've unfortunately in Southern California taken out a ton of our wetlands. We used to have, if you're a San Diego person, wetlands that would go all the way out through Mission Valley to like the Qualcomm Stadium or like San Diego State. And then we drained it. And unfortunately, that's something that, you know, now we're all built up there and we're not going to be able to get that back. But but basically that was something that really got rid of a lot of pollutants. So some of these are starting to be restored in like Encinitas Carlsbad that I've seen. Um, then uh, this is an estuary. An estuary is where water, fresh water comes down and it starts going into the ocean. And in these, or um, this is the most diverse ecosystem in the world after the rainforests. So this is the second most diverse system in the world. So it, it's a mixture of fresh water and salt water. Tons of animals like lay their babies there. Um, they stay there for safety. Um, it's, it's just a very diverse place where algae, seaweed, marsh grass, all kinds of things can grow. Worms, oysters, 
all kinds of neat things. One cool thing that's there that was in um, Sea of Cortez when I was down there was mangrove trees. Mangrove trees also grow in the United States and like Florida, but a mangrove tree has an amazing adaptation to be able to handle the salt and animals that live there or things that live there have to be able to handle some salt. The mangrove trees actually take all the salt that they raise up from the, this water and they push all that salt to one leaf. And that one leaf gets so full of salt that eventually it just falls off and dies. And then the rest of the tree can get fresh water. And then once that leaf falls off and dies, then it'll start pushing all of the salt it gets to another leaf. And that's kind of the sacrificial leaf that like takes all the salt for the whole rest of the tree until it falls off and dies. It's an amazing adaptation. It's so cool. Anyways, um, thank you for listening and I hope you guys have a great day.